Before we get in this totally fire video, just want to say go ahead, smash that red subscribe button down below. Also, do not forget to comment who you guys want to see in a future episode. That being said, I hope you guys enjoy the video and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Film Room. We're here today with my guy, Jerry Ostrowski, another PA guy, Tulsa guy, <laughs> but more importantly, a PA guy, um, you know, second exactly. PA guy on here. Uh, how are you doing today, Jerry? I'm doing great, man. It's uh, just rolling along. Just uh, got another year older a couple weeks ago and just, you know, raising a family and uh, uh, trying to enjoy myself. Yes, sir. Happy belated birthday, Jerry. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. No problem, man. When I say like one of the nicest people ever, I mean, Jerry, you are like the nicest guy I've ever met. I will never forget when I left Tulsa and you opened your house to me. You said you can come. You can stay with us for a week because there were some yeah. schools down there that were interested. You said you can come stay here, work out with us, use the gym, whatever. And I mean, nicest, I mean, nicest person I've ever met. I mean, it's Southern hospitality, hey. man. PA pipeline. <laughs> But that's what it's all about. I mean, we're all we're all in this together. I mean, football yes, is an amazing sport. Uh, it's the greatest team sport still left, even though there is a lot of individuality creeping into football, especially at the at the college level. Um, you know, us old guys aren't into some of the new things that are happening. But um, it's it's about family. It's about it's about helping each other. It's what it's always been about. And, and you know, generations don't don't change that. I mean, you know, as an older guy now. Um, I know what it's about. I already, I already got myself, you know, I know what it is. I figured things out. So now it's my turn to try to help others. And no, man, same thing. Now, if you come to Tulsa, just give me a call. I got a place for you to stay. Yes, sir. Appreciate it, Jerry. And that, that's kind of a really good segue into the, into our first question today. Um, you know, like I said, you're a PA guy. So going from PA to Tulsa isn't really common. I mean, it's kind of ironic that I say that because, you know, PA right. to Tulsa for you, PA to Tulsa for me. So, you know, probably the only two people that have done it in a while. But um, well, PA, PA to Tulsa for me was was a lot more common than for you. Um, believe me, when myself I saw somebody from Pennsylvania on the roster, I was excited. Um, we probably had twenty five guys or so from uh, Pennsylvania and Canada back when I played at Tulsa. Wow, um, we had quite a few of them. Um, there was a there was a man named Alex. Uh, uh, I want to always say Alex Gibbs, Alex Phillips. Um, Alex Phillips and his brother, um, uh, kind of funded that whole thing. When I say funded it, helped with the recruiting flying coaches to, to Pennsylvania. Uh, my offensive line coach was Mark Thomas. He played at Penn state. And I don't know about you as a kid, that's where I wanted to play. I wanted to be a Nittany lion. I always wanted to play there. Well, that didn't happen. I didn't have that opportunity. Um, they wanted me to walk on and I had scholarship offers, so I wasn't going to do that, but I figured if I couldn't play for Joe, I would play for a guy that did play for Joe and I played for Mark Thomas. who's from the Pittsburgh area. I believe I keep on to say Elizabeth town, but I'm not quite sure. Um, and he was my line coach and he's got to handle all the recruiting and there for a while our you know, that run in the nineties, uh, uh, you know, late eighties and nineties, uh, that was all a lot of Pennsylvania guys. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I didn't even get to finish the question. I mean, you, you knew exactly where I was going with that. And I was just going to say like, what made Tulsa special and, you know, how, how is it like going from there? But you answered that perfectly kind of, you know, just read my mind right there. But um, it, to me, to me, Dami, I thought Pennsylvania, the people were a lot, the Tulsa, the people were a lot like they were in Pennsylvania, a lot of hardworking blue collar type people, good people. You have to remember a lot of, with that whole oil thing going on, Tulsa people went to Western PA. We're working that, that Mississippi uh, uh, shale line or whatever they call that up there and a lot of people from pittsburgh went to tulsa you know in the oil game so there was a lot of relationships built there through oil in the 70s yes sir i mean that's awesome that uh you know you had people already starting to go down there and that like that drew your attention and uh you know obviously when i went it was kind of different but i mean you you took me in and uh you made the transition seamless um having another guy just to talk to another pa guy knowing what's right. like having to do the distance so uh you know like i said i just really appreciate everything you've done for me and, hey, um, no problem. I mean, and it's funny, there's more than just me down here from Pennsylvania that have ended up marrying girls from Oklahoma and, and, and have lived here. And like I told my parents and my parents moved here in 09 from the Philly area. I didn't uh, know that. Wow. Yeah. My, my, I'm sorry, not 09, 99. So they moved here in 1999. My father passed away in 09, but my mom still lives here. And I told him, I said, whether I get married to a girl from here or not, I'm going to live in Tulsa. I really, really like it. I love the town. I love, I love uh, everything about it. So if I get married, you know, and I have grand, you know, there's grandkids and all that stuff involved. Um, you might want to move down here because I'm not going back. And uh, they moved down here and, um, you know, the, other than the heat, they enjoy it as well. 
Yeah, I definitely, I definitely see why. I mean, the heat was an adjustment too, so I, I can see, I can see that. But I mean, it's, it's kind of a lot, a lot of similar, uh, a lot of similarities between PA and, and Tulsa. But um, we're gonna fast forward a little bit here for my second question. You got drafted by the Bills, and you played all eight of your NFL seasons for the Bills. So, um, can you just uh, explain what it was like playing for such an awesome fan base that is Bills Mafia? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewind a little bit. I actually <laughs> got picked by the Chiefs. Oh. And then I was released by the Chiefs and went to Atlanta for a cup of coffee, and they released me. Then I went to Buffalo. So oh. my my times playing, yes, were all in Buffalo. And if you count my two years on the practice squad, I was up there for 10. So um, the Buffalo fan base has always been amazing. Um, back when Kelly was playing, Thurman, Bruce, Andre Reed, all those guys, I mean, you're putting 81,000 people in that place every weekend on a, on a home game. And the funny thing is, if you go to Buffalo and you see the size of the town, you're like, where are they getting all these people from? Um, you know, Buffalo is with the industry and steel and everything kind of dying out. Um, a lot of people, you know, Buffalo kind of for a while suffered a brain, uh, uh, a brain drain. A lot of people left. They went, you know, the young kids went to college and went somewhere else. But the people of Buffalo are so good. They're just such good people. But it also takes that surrounding area. And, and that's what's so cool about the Bills. It's a regional franchise. So the, the mafia now is nationwide. I mean, it's everybody's jumping on board. But Some that's what's tables. really cool about the fan base. It's a regional fan base. So you get all different, you know, you get all kinds of kinds. You get Canadians, Western New York, uh, Northwest Pennsylvania. Um, you get people from everywhere to come to Bills games, and it's it's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I totally see that. Uh, personally, when the Steelers, if they don't make it, or they you know they get bounced up the up the club early, um, I'm a Bills Bills Mafia all the way. I'm rooting for them. <clears throat> as soon as the as soon as Steelers are out, I'm going Bills. Well, I'll so, give you I'll give you that. I mean, I I still have a little bit of that in me. I I, I still cheer for the Eagles because that's where I grew up. I know, um, I get it. Um, you know, you just have to do it. It's in your blood, right? You can't yes, sir. you can't denounce the Steelers. I mean. They right. probably kick you out of the house. I mean, as yeah. they should. But no, Buffalo is a good uh, a good fan base to join up with if you uh, if you need one. Yes, sir. I mean, I couldn't even imagine going against the Steelers now. I mean, I was lucky enough to play there at Heinz. I'm still calling it Heinz Field. It's not Acura <clears throat> to me. I know some people don't care about that. It's Heinz Field to me. I what are, what's to, the new name of it? Uh, it's Acura Stadium. So it used to be Heinz Field, and then the right. naming rights changed. So now it's Acura Stadium, which is I heard an insurance company uh, based in Michigan. Okay. But um, I'm still gonna that call makes it a lot Field. of sense, right? Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But I'm still going to call it Heinz Field. <laughs> but, I mean, I played there. I was lucky enough to play there four times in high school, so I'm never I'm never going to go. Yeah, you guys Steelers. had Whitfield Championships there, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, they still have the Whitfield Championship, right? Uh, Yeah, it's not. Western you, PA, they call it Whitfield. Wasn't it called Whitfield? Yes, sir. It's still, it's still a Whitfield. So, it used to be four classifications, and all four were at Heinz Field. But since it went to six, right. I think they tried to do three there and three at, like, another location. But, um, yeah, it's – that's awesome. You really fortunate to play for such an awesome fan base. And, uh, you know, today that's probably one of the second, I'll say the second best fan base because nothing well, beats cool, uh, Steeler well, Nation. Yeah. I mean, Steeler fan base is good, but the cool thing about the Bills Mafia is like, you know, the one thing I like and uh, Hey, let's, let's face facts. Twitter is, is old guy. Old guys like Twitter. I mean, it, it, they're lazy. Everything's right there, you know, news, whatever you need, but Twitter's allowed me to meet a lot of really cool people from Buffalo really cool people that I hadn't known before just through being, you know, fans and them recognizing the name. I've gotten to reconnect with teammates that I'd lost touch of the same thing through Twitter. So Twitter has been great. And um, I'm really trying to get up there for the home opener, which is Monday night, second game of the season, Monday night against the Titans, really trying to get up there for that. But if not, I'll get up for one of the other games, um, a game that makes sense where maybe Owens at home or not playing on the road. And, uh, you know, go up and check a, ch check a game out because this is it. I'm, uh, they're only playing one more, I think, after this year, one more season in uh, in the old stadium, then they're getting a new one across yeah, the street. That's so. just about to say, uh, one last one last trip up there before they build, like, the, uh, the big state of the art one. Right. But um, So my third question is, you know, it's every big man's dream to score a touchdown. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you scored one. Uh, you guys were playing a home game against the Chargers the San Diego Chargers at the time. So can you just explain us the play and like what you like, how it felt to score a touchdown and just like what you were thinking when you saw the ball rolling towards you in the end zone? Well, Dom, you saw the play. It, it I, was, I saw it. It was, it was ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, 
I snapped the ball. I stepped off. I, I, my, my nose guard slanted away. Um, I went up to the linebacker and had the linebacker and at the end kind of sloughed off of him and turned around to see what was going on. And you know how it is as a lineman, it, everything's happening behind you. Right. Right. So if you're, if you got a big enough crowd, you can tell what's going on by listening. Right. So right. you're blocking somebody when you hear, Ooh, like everybody has that collective like gasp. Some good's not happening. Right. So Jonathan Linton, you know, uh, uncharacter- uncharacteristically put the ball on the ground and it just happened to roll in front of me and land at my feet. And I was like, I guess I'll land on that. <laughs> I basically fell on the ground and that was the end of it. So, you know, no, no pass play designed for the extra lineman in the game. None of that stuff. I was just fortunate enough to fall on a loose ball. And but you know what? When you've never scored one before and you never scored another one after that, I don't care how it happens. Yeah. And I don't care what they say about Gronk spiking it. I smashed that thing, dude. Smashed yeah. it. So Gronk probably watched me smash that ball because that's, I, I, it's funny. I spiked it so hard. I come right off the field and the equipment manager's running on the field. I'm like, what's he doing? He wanted to get the ball for me. I was so <laughs> excited. I didn't even care about the ball. I was just, you know, happy we scored a touchdown. That's great. I mean, like I said, that's every man, every big man's dream is to, uh, you know, just get get the ball <laughs> once. But right. I mean, to score a touchdown, that's insane. <laughs> but um it's have you ever scored one no no i haven't um i have scored two-point conversion when i was like right. when i was like six you know youth football you know beating the team by a lot of points the coach is like uh you want to go run the ball <laughs> i'm like sure and yeah. i'm like the second heaviest dude on the field and i just run I just the ball around straight <laughs> see but, i, I mean, never played youth football because i weighed too much i played up because i weighed too much so i barely well, I had to play up two teams wow i, I, I like played up one. 25 i was like nine years old <laughs> wow that's great. So, I was 105 yeah. pounds in kindergarten, and then I lost all the weight. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> big dude struggle. But um, <laughs> so uh, my fourth question is, this is probably the most recent thing, but um, you were named to the All Tulsa All Century team. Um, so how did it feel just getting that accolade and having your number retired at uh, H.A. Chapman Stadium? Well, uh, that was amazing in itself. Um, that's one of – that's that's probably my – as far as football goes, and I've gotten some pretty cool honors – that's probably my the greatest honor I've had is to be to have my number retired and not not just because my number's retired it's who's my number retired with and you look at that list and it's guys like I don't you know Jerry some guy named Jerry Rome some guy named Steve Largent who's in the Hall of Fame some guy named Drew Pearson who's in the Hall of Fame you know all these guys that are that are Hall you know Hall of Fame NFL Hall of Fame players and I'm on this wall with those guys um it's really, really special. Um, to me, that's probably the the biggest honor of all of them is to, you know, I was a, was an AP All-American and all that, and it was cool to meet Bob Hope. But to have that happen and, you know, your number never be worn by anybody else, um, pretty pretty special. They're pretty humbling, actually, very humbling. That's awesome. I mean, I remember every day walking to the facility and I <clears> – <throat> You taking the knee were just uh, on the wall, like first first guy walking in. I used to see yeah. that every every day walking in. Uh, Back when we thought we was looking good with that hair like that, yeah, <laughs> I got you. But no, that's awesome. You know, that's that's like something everybody dreams of getting like their their uh, number retired. I mean, you know, that's that's your number. That's something like you know, and like I don't know. It's weird because like a number is like special to everybody. So people are like, oh, it's just a number, but like right. it's really not because you like kind of build that number. You like take that number like to be your own, and then the you know, just like like that's yours forever. That's just something, right? Crazy. The thing is, is the double the double nickel at Tulsa has been worn by some really, really good players. I mean, Kaz Kazadi wore it. Um, he played in the NFL a little bit. Now he's a strength coach at TCU. Um, Nelson Coleman wore it. Nelson is, I think, still the leading tackler in the history of the University of Tulsa. Um, but yet they retired it with my name. Um, it's humbling. Like I said, it's humbling because those guys are as deserving, you know, they're as deserving for these these accolades as I am. Right. But um, I don't know. I just think it's, uh, you know, a product that just, you know, you work hard, you show up every day and you're reliable and, you know, you do the best you can and good things will happen. Yes, sir. So my last question before we get into the uh, into the Irishman is, um, you know, you played football a long time ago. Not calling you old or anything. Trust me, I never do that. But, yeah, I'm uh, you 52, played... <laughs> man. I, it's all out there. I'm 52 years old. I am old. <laughs> but, I'm a dinosaur. Played played back in the uh, 80s and 90s so obviously there's been a, a lot of advancements in the, the game of football 
So what's one advancement that we have today that you wish you would have had the luxury of playing with back then? Hmm, that I wish I'd have played with? Probably, and I got a little bit of it, is, is equipment, man. Y'all got some really cool equipment nowadays. The stuff as light as can be. Um, it's like you don't even have it on. Um, you know, to me, the equipment is just, you know, leaps and bounds better than when I played. And also, um, the science side of the training is something that I think is, I'm a weight room guy. I love the weight room. I think the weight room is the difference maker. And when you got a good strength coach, your program is going to be good. And EA is as is, is good as anybody in the country, Eric Anthony, that we have at Tulsa. Um, but the fact now of what they do and the science behind it and the nutrition and having a nutrition, we didn't have a nutritionist, you know, um, we didn't, we didn't do that stuff. We didn't have any of that. I mean, I was talking about that today, you know, rolling off the practice field, hundred some degrees. And we were eating at the cafeteria in La Fortune. That's where we, that's where we lived. We also stayed in one dorm back then, you know, we're eating patty melts, patty melts and fries. I mean, that that's not, I mean, and then you had an ice cream machine, you know, unlimited ice. You just did, you did things differently back then. I mean, even pregame steaks and baked potatoes and, and fried chicken, you know, that was the night before the game. And I just wish we had a little bit more of the science, not only in the weight room, but also uh, in the equipment. Yes, sir. I mean, yeah, we're definitely, we're definitely lucky with the, uh, <clears throat> like all these new helmets and stuff coming out, uh, protecting, you know, head injuries. Um, you know, face masks, being able just to handle neck injuries and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's definitely come a long way and it's a lot well, different, different when you guys played because uh, back right, then it's Dom, more like. Yeah, and think about it, Dom. I mean, you got these guys that are training more, they're stronger, they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger with lighter equipment. I mean, there's no, no, no kidding why there's so many violent collisions in football. I mean, it's so a lot. That's why I think a lot of these rule changes to help in certain areas are good. Um, it doesn't take a man to blind to blindside somebody um that's not hard to do you know take some of those types of things out of the game try to save some people save some unnecessary injuries and and wear and tear on bodies but um yeah it's just difference the science of the game the science behind the scenes is a lot is a lot better now than it was yes sir but uh, that's all the questions i got for today so you guys know how it goes in the film room half half review half uh half interview half movie review and uh, Jerry picked the Irishman. We've been working on this one for a while. This was supposed to be one yeah. of the, the first videos, but you know, Jerry, I'm just really appreciative, really appreciative of your time. I know how busy you are. Um, no, you know, I mean we can do this whenever you want. I enjoy these things. I like to do this stuff. Um, so no, anytime you you know you need somebody, you want to do something else, I'm I'm all for it, man. It's it's a good time. Sure. I like to. It's like I said, it's a great way that you can connect with people again. Right. Um, unlike when I was your age and you had you know a rotary phone and in those types of things yeah but uh is there, is there a reason for uh picking the irishman yeah there is there's a couple different reasons one is i'm a mafia freak i love the mafia um i wore my i don't know if you can see it or not but i wore trench my mafia my trench mafia shirt today yes, sir. uh which is our group at oklahoma city jared conrad started uh, we, we train offensive linemen high school guys some college guys um jared does a tremendous job um but I, I like the aspect of the mafia. I like the the structure. Um, there's still a lot of people that run companies and run their organizations very much built off the mob model with a boss and conciliaries and underbosses and capos and soldiers and the whole nine yards. Um, takes place in the Northeast, um, right. <clears throat> Philly area, up in Jersey and New York. Um, this whole teamster thing was, was huge to me because my grandfather was a teamster, um, huge union man. And, uh, he loaded trucks. He started his first job. He loaded trucks for Leonard toes, toes trucking. You probably don't know this, but Leonard toes was, uh, was an owner of the Philadelphia Eagles at one I time. I did not know. He actually crazy. hired Dick for meal. Um, <clears throat> so that, and then when you put De Niro Pesci, you know, Pacino and all these guys in one movie, it's really hard to beat so yeah. that's why i picked it that's crazy because uh my grandpa um uh my pap i call him he was a, the mayor of clarendon uh for a long time when uh back when he was alive and uh he was a teamster too so um my my uh my pap knew all about that stuff and uh we have a we have a hoffa poster uh, up in the room above me so i was like 
Hoffa, Hoffa. And I was like, all right, now I know what this is from. And I went up and I asked my dad about it. And he explained me the story, but um, right. man, I, I never knew about it. So I was just a really cool, not coincidence, just, I guess, really cool. Just fact from the movie. And the, I guess. and the fact that we're football guys, you know, forever, there was a legend that Jimmy Hoffa was buried on the 40 yard line of the Meadowlands. Really? You can look it up for forever. They, they took, they've taken, they took sonar out there, different things, trying to see if they could find Hoffa's body. That's crazy. <clears throat> Obviously he wasn't when they dug the place up, they looked and they couldn't find him. but, um, but no, uh, interesting stuff. Really yeah. interesting. Stuff. That's crazy. Uh, you highlighted Pesci in this, um, because I see him and I think home alone and, uh, so yes. Think, like you think uh like all these mom movies and stuff and i'm sitting there because my dad was watching a movie with him in it the other day and i was like who is that guy he said pesci and i was like who's that <laughs> and then i'm sitting there i'm like oh that's a guy from home alone and then he's well, like i see pesci and i think the two utes i think of um uh my cousin Vinny when he was the lawyer down in I've mississippi that, that, one. that that's one you could watch too and review yeah that's i've, I've seen that one with uh with um robert <clears throat> no not robert Don yeah robert donnie jr and uh marissa tomei i'm pretty sure no it's uh it's uh it's Karate Kid. It's Ralph Macchio. Yeah, it's Ralph Macchio. It's Ralph Macchio. Yeah. Dang, I I'm, I got, I got that movie all messed up. Then I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, it's not Robert Downey Jr. It's Ralph Macchio. It's it's our, my cousin Vinny. Yeah. I'm, yeah. What am I? I'm thinking of another one. I can't. I can't remember which one. I'm, all right, I have it all messed Robert up. Robert Downey Jr. was in a Weird Science. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think which. No, that was a, That's a Pittsburgh one. The one with Marissa Tomei and Robert Downey Jr. I'm. I'm all messed up. No, but I have seen my cousin Vinny. I've seen like five minutes of it. I. I know I have, but I'm gonna go back, rewatch that. But uh, so yeah, you need get, to. Let's get into into the Irishman. So, what you what you like about it so much? Well, Frank Sheeran, I really enjoyed, which is De Niro's character, because Frank to me reminds me of an offensive lineman. Um, not in the fact that he's a professional hitman and he goes and kills people, but that he was very loyal to who he worked for and he followed orders very well. And even though he might not like those orders sometimes, he did them anyway, which is the life of an offensive lineman, if you really want to get down to it. We block, we do things, we may not agree with this, we may not agree with that. We might grinch and moan, you know, but we're all going to get, you know, we're all going to stand up from underneath that shade tree out in the corner of the end zone We'll snap our helmets on and go do it. So, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed his character. Obviously there's some history. It's not really, you know, historically correct, or we don't think it's historically correct. It might be, but um, you know, just that whole aspect to it, the mob and, and, and how the whole thing, uh, how the whole thing, you know, started from beginning to end. Yeah. I definitely see where you're coming from on that. I mean, I like mob movies. Um, I think, Goodfellas and you know Godfather are like some of the best movies of all time. Um, I think the I think those two are still better than this. This is a good film, but I still think those two are better than this, which is crazy. Oh, come on, man! You're talking about the classics of the classics. Of course yeah, it is. Yeah. But I mean, I mean Goodfellas is Goodfellas is now. You know, Godfather is great too, but I still I mean, part of me thinks Goodfellas is better than Godfather. That's fair. It's just it's just crazy because you have De Niro and Pacino, and uh, you know, ones in, ones in each one one's in each of them and then they're both in this so i just think that's kind of ironic right but um no i didn't even know that they're they did cgi in this because they de yeah. all the characters i was like i couldn't even tell and then i like looked it up and i was like wow that's in that's incredible technology um i thought the cast was absolutely spectacular like you said pesci um de niro um Al well hey, it goes all the way down to it goes all the way down to harvey cartel playing angelo bruno right who, you know, Angelo Bruno was the was the mob boss of the Philly mob, and he, of course, got killed. Um, you know, that whole, he was killed by, I believe, uh, Nicky Scarfo, and then little Nicky Scarfo, who they called the Chicken Man, he got blown up one night. It's actually in a spring scene song, uh, Atlantic City. Um, the opening line of the song goes, well, they blew up the Chicken Man in Philly last night. That was uh, Nicky Scarfo, who I believe killed Bruno. But, you know, these are names from when I was a kid. Right. you know when you watch the news and I, that's why you know that's kind of was intriguing about it but yeah i mean look at the cast i mean yeah. ray romano was you know uh bill buffalino it was you know it was russell buffalino's brother who played the corrupt teamster lawyer um just an amazing cast of of characters yeah i, re I really like the sets in this film too i mean they stayed true like the time period 
I thought like everything looked like straight out of like the, yes. the time period is all time correct. So I just thought it all looked uh, really cool. I thought the practical effects really cool with like, uh, you know, like the, the hair and like, the, just like how people, like they made these characters, they made the cast really like make these characters come alive. And I just, I think it really like enhanced the experience of this. And I think uh, Scorsese did, you know, he always makes good films. And I think this is, uh, this is one of his best ones. And uh, I'd see why a lot of people love this film. Yeah, I, I, never, mean, like, I never saw you, it until you, you recommended about, it. Right. You talk about the hair and all that stuff and the clothing. I mean, even the cars, the big trunk cars, right? Mobsters always had a car with a big trunk, you know, whether it be a Cadillac or a big Buick. And then, like, for instance, the last scene of the movie, um, I don't know. Are we supposed to give away to you, to their spoiler alerts? Uh, on this? I, try, I try to stay away um, from, the, uh, from the spoilers. Yeah. But so, I mean, obviously, could, the last could. scene of the movie, which we all know about, um, you know, you walk in the house and there's all that paneling, that dark wood paneling. I mean, that was such a 70s thing. I mean, everybody had a living room with paneling up, you know, uh, yeah. lots of dark wood and all that. So, I mean, yeah, it was it was time appropriate uh, from top to bottom. And it was uh, but I thought the character that that was really the most intriguing of the whole thing was not Jimmy. It wasn't Pacino. Um, it was it was Frank. It was Frank Sheeran. It was it was De Niro's character and how he. You know, you think these guys, it's just like watching Sopranos, right? It's you, you fall in love with these characters and you're like, you know, he's a good guy. He wants to be with his girls and he befriends Jimmy and they become friends and he's going to protect them. But when it's all said and done after this one's obviously a three hour plus movie. But when it's all said and done, these guys are horrible people. You know, yeah. they kill they murder, they steal, they skim, they do, they racketeer, they do everything. And it's so funny, like, you know, find me a bigger argument than did, did, uh, did, did Tony Soprano live or die, right? Right. And I was reading the book, the Talking Sopranos book um, that was put out by an Imperioli and uh, Stephen Sharippa, who played, uh, uh, Sharippa played, um, uh, can't remember obviously imperially played christopher but they they talk about all these things and that's one of the things that david chase who's the writer of the sopranos talks about he's like you know you find yourself falling in love with like paulie and silvio and all these characters and you're like how else could the, the show end they gotta die they're they're just bad yeah. people right right they're mobsters so anyway it's uh yeah really well done Great movie and anything, amazing cast. Anything you didn't like? Oh, I think some of it drug on a little bit. Yeah. I think so. that, you know, they made it over three hours. It got a little bit draggy uh, here yeah. and there, but but no, I mean, all in all, I enjoyed all of it. I mean, I I had a buddy of mine was like, oh, you're going to have to sit down and watch it in two parts or three parts. I watched it straight through. Yeah. I, I didn't have any problem watching it straight through. I was captivated the whole time. Yeah. See, I'm, uh, I'm really with well done. I'm uh, on the side with your friend. I, I did think it was, it was pretty long. Three and a half hours um, is, is, is pretty, is really long. I started this movie at like four and I was like, checking my watch. I'm like, it's seven 30. I'm like, this is, <laughs> this is my whole, well, whole let afternoon. me ask you this. Are you a stranger things guy? I am, but that's, uh, I see, I see where you're going with that, but yeah, I am a stranger things guy. And it, Cause I'm going to tell you this. So the, the, the first part of the last season is out, right? So we watch all of it. Right. So it was Friday night, and uh, I think it was July 1st. I come home, had dinner, and my oldest boy was home. My, my son Jackson was coaching at Drake. He was home for a couple of weeks before they had to go up and finish camps and get ready for, for, for training camp. He walks over to the table, and he puts a drink down. He goes, are you up for it? I go, are you talking about four and a half hours worth of TV? He goes, yep. I said, let's do it. So we watched the last two episodes just right smack dab through that's awesome. but uh i think if i get intrigued by something i can yeah. now there's some things i can't but this i definitely be and, and well it's like stranger things for me because it's a time period show right right so like when they they have the prom scene and and the dances and all that and the clothes that's when i was a kid that when that show is taking place is when i was the same age and doing the same stuff so I think that's why I get that's why I got intrigued with the Irishman because that's where I grew up. It's what I knew, you know. It's a time period of my life when I was younger that I remember. So that's why I was was uh, definitely hooked on it. 
Yeah, no, I, I definitely see I see two sides of the argument, especially after you saying that uh, with Stranger Things. I could I could see why, especially because this movie is like closer to you, more so closer to you than it is to me. Right. So I definitely see why. But um, Scorsese said he wanted to stay true to, to like Frank's um, like recollection of the events. So right. like I, I respect him from like a directorial standpoint. Like I know what he was going for. But I mean, when you're telling a story that's like so close to being true, I kind of wish it would have just been true throughout because then you kind of find yourself like, is this true? And then going back and then is this true going back? And just like, I just found myself going back and forth between like the uh, like Safari right. and the movie back and forth just because I wanted to know like what really was going on. But I mean, other than that, um, I thought this movie was uh, really good. Those were two really tiny, tiny gripes I had. But um, since this is a, a streaming movie, it's on um, Netflix. At a, we call it streams here. It's on the stream scale. At a, at a zero out of 10 streams, how many are you giving it? How many am I giving it? I give it an eight. eight? It's an eight. It's not a classic. Um, it's not a, every time it's not like, it's not like Pulp Fiction for me. Every time it's on, I got to stop and watch it. Or, you know, there's those movies, Shawshank Redemption, um, Pulp Fiction, The Blues Brothers, Big Lebowski, Caddyshack, or something like that, that when you're on, you got to watch them. Um, this doesn't meet that level, but it's, it's really damn good. So I give it an eight. Yes, sir. Um, for me, I'm going I'm going 8.3 streams out of 10 um, just because, you know, it was long. I found myself, like I said, closing out of the app and coming back. So, um, but this this piece isn't as close to me as it is to you. I'm surprised I'm a little bit higher on it than you are, but um, I don't see my – it's a good film. I think it's a good time to watch every now and then. Like, I don't think I'll come back to this for, like, right. a like, like couple months, like maybe a year. I feel like this is like a, like a mood movie. Like, you kind of got to be, like, wanting, like, a really, like, deep story. But um, eight point three—that's what I'm giving it. And, well, the uh, part that I noticed was you were really into the to the CGI and all that, like that, which I understand. Being a younger guy, that's something you know. I think it's cool too, but I was more interested in the story. Yeah, I like not, character development. I like, yeah. like for instance, I like, um, uh, I like Tarantino movies. Yeah, there's just a lot of dialect. Um, I like the Coen Brothers movies because there's a lot of dialect. I don't need a ton of scenery. I don't need a ton of specialties and sound and, and 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 you know special effects and all that. I like dialogue, a lot yeah. of words. Sorry about that, guys. It got cut off right here, uh, but we're back. Uh, you know, got to finish the episode strong. Jerry was talking about how he likes dialogue more so in films, where I was more so kind of like the aesthetic and like the set of the movie. Right. Uh, yeah, we're just gonna hop right back into it, pick up right where we left off. No, it's like I said, I like Tarantino movies because there's a lot of dialogue. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of talking back and forth between characters. That's how the thing is built. Like, for instance, one to give you an example, one of my favorite scenes is in um uh in uh Reservoir Dogs. There's a scene at the beginning of the movie where they're all sitting around a table and they all have they start talking about their names, like Mr. Pink, Mr. White, and all that, and they're going all the way around the room and you know, why am I Mr. Pink? Why can't I be Mr. Blue? And they and then they start talking about, you know, giving tips. And I believe it's Bashimi's character is like, I don't tip. And they like you're getting so there's these those tight dialogue deals like that. I really, I really like a lot. I mean, those I think is what what makes movies for me. Yeah. I mean, it's probably different just because like I'm a younger guy. So like the movies I grew up with are more like um I mean, I know Scorsese hates these films. He probably would hate to hear me say this, but Marvel films. I know he hates right. Marvel films. He doesn't consider them movies. Um, but I mean, growing up with like Marvel movies and like superhero movies, it's mainly just like action and not really that much about character development, but they still get the story across. So I think I kind of get more so caught up like in like how the film looks and like their attention, like the action and like keeping my attention more so like character. Like I appreciate good character development, but uh, I definitely think um, I would rather see like, I, I see like a difference where it's like, you're talking about right. like, dialogue where I was like okay I could kind of not care as much about as like full character like as like dynamic character development if there's like really insane action so I don't know maybe that's just like an age thing well I could get my I could get my 12 year old up here and you two could do the whole Sonic the Hedgehog 2 thing like you like I think you've already done yeah and my man can roll some Sonic the Hedgehog now he, he's all about Sonic the Hedgehog movies the first one was good i wasn't a big fan of the second one i went so i went with my friend i wasn't I wasn't a big fan of that second one but um uh, you got anything else you anything else you want to say about about the movie or uh just about about anything football no man i just uh just want to say good luck to you um i'm happy you you, you found a place that uh you can call home you get an opportunity to compete 
get an opportunity to get on the field and play. Um, you know, I think that's the biggest thing about football is kids get hang, hung up in where they're playing. The football is about fit. You're going right. to fit somewhere um, and you can't force fit. And I try to tell people when they're going through recruiting and, you know, and all that, I'm like, look, man, you'll, you'll know where you belong eventually. But the best part about playing football is what? Playing football. Playing football. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's what's fun. So whether it's D1, you know, D1, D1, AA, D2, D8, it doesn't matter where you fit and you get a chance to play. And, um, you know, I wish you're still in Tulsa, but, I'm just happy you found a place that, uh, that that you fit and you love and you call home, you get a chance to play. And I know it's been a while for you. It's been a few years since you had a chance to start. And and um, looking forward to to watching you because uh, I'll be watching on stream. Believe me, ESPN Plus, I know you all be on. Appreciate, um, appreciate that, Jerry. I, I really appreciate really appreciate that, Jerry. You know, you know, it's been a, been a long time coming. Um, September 3rd, we kick off against uh, ULL, the Raging Cajuns on uh, ESPN plus and you know I'm just excited to get out there with my teammates and uh you know it's like I said it's been a, like you previously said it's been a while since uh since I started a game I played a lot at guard last year but to um you know it's it's a whole different type of energy heading into a season where um you know you're gonna be you know making your first first collegiate start like I'll never forget my first high school start I mean the first collegiate you know the first one's always you know it's just right. always something special about it but uh, I really appreciate that um your son Owen is gonna be a beast he's a DN at the University of Tulsa um yeah, just 48, I believe. Um, yeah, he wears 48. To, yeah, he's absolute beast. He's, he's, not, he's not like us, man. He's not one like of, us. One of the, he's pretty. One he's of the, pretty, man. One of the strongest dudes I've ever seen in the <laughs> weight room for, for how young he is. That dude's a total beast. Um, he's going he's gonna to be wreaking havoc all over the American Conference for years to come. And uh, I'm just, likewise, I'm going to be watching. I watch you. Well, I already watched also every Saturday. My teammates are like, why are you watching them? I'm like, because I, I, my boys are still playing, man. Those are still right. my guys, you know. And so there you go. You answer your question. You know, you, you look at that and and it, that's what it's about. It's about that. That was relationships that you, that you built. You know, you talk about still having a relationship with, you know, you, you talk to X, who's at Liberty now. You talk to some of these other guys. It's about those relationships. I mean, the guys that I you know, that I played with in college, I still talk to, you know, yeah. we still have that, that friendship. And, and that's the, that's the coolest thing about, about football. I mean, football is fun to play and everything. Eventually it goes away and you can't play anymore, but those relationships and friendships that you built don't go away. And yeah. that's what's special. I mean, it's crazy. Cause I remember being in high school and, you know, everyone grows up wanting to play it for like, you know, like you said, Penn state, uh, everyone's played for like the big hometown team, but it's like, it's football. I mean, football can just take you anywhere. Like never what I thought I went right. to Tulsa. And then, you know, to go from uh, Tulsa to Louisiana. Cause when I was in high school, I'm like oh, eight hours away. It's probably my max. It's probably as far away as I want to go. And now I'm 16 hours away. And uh, you know, I couldn't be happier. Um, you, like I, said, I got a you, question for you. Do you know anybody it? down there that can make sauce? I, I, this is going to sound corny, but <laughs> shout out my head coach, Frank Selfo. He was at media day the other day, hyping up his uh, cream. I think he said it was cream sauce. Because our uh, coach Selfo's a uh, big Italian guy, uh, we're like the only two Italians down there. But um, he he was hyping up his his uh, sauce recipe at Southland Media Day earlier earlier last week. So Coach Selfo, you know he can make a sauce. Well, I, I tell I want to see his red sauce, man. I want to see his red sauce. That's good. That's awesome. I'm glad you have somebody that you can uh, you can relate to a little bit. <laughs> Sir, I mean, fortunately, my team lost. The winner got to go over to his house and uh you know, have dinner, um, you know, Italian dinner. My team lost in the championship, um, came close. But, oh, you know, the off, off season competing. Yes, sir. It came close, but yeah. you, you know how it goes. There's no, there's no award for second place. There's no participation yeah. trophies in, uh, in football, but um, exactly. yeah, came up short, but it is what it is. But coach Selfo, I've never had it. I don't know. I'm putting my neck out there for him. <laughs> uh, taking his word at Southland media day. And uh, yeah. So, but before we end this episode, I actually want to give a shout out to, Katie Tolley. Uh, she is, uh, I'm pretty sure you're, you're friends with her, Jerry. Um, she I makes, know her. I met, she's one of the people I met on the internet, man, yes, on, on Twitter. One of my Twitter friends. Yes, sir. She makes some of the craziest, insanest mugs ever. I got this one. Uh, this is my school logo right here, the Southeast Louisiana uh, Lion. And then on the back, uh, I have my name. Um, I have one. Obviously, that's mine. My mom is one. My dad has one. And one of my coaches actually has one. And I know Jerry has one for Bill's Mafia. Um, she does any color, any logo. Um, 
you know, some of the stuff, she, I mean, all the stuff she does is absolutely incredible. So I'm going to link her Twitter down below. So if you're interested in getting a mug like this, I mean, it's a Yeti, it's insulated. It's going to keep your stuff hot. It's going to keep your stuff cold. Um, Jerry, Jerry knows all about it. He's just telling me how hot and his he, coffee stays. And here's the best part about it. Again, she's, she's a good person. Yes, sir. Um, she takes pride in what she does. She has a talent. She loves what she does. She takes pride in it and she, she does a great job. She's a good person. Uh, her brother uh, is on Twitter as well. Um, got to be buddies with him uh, just through talking and stuff. And I'm really looking forward to meeting some of these people face to face one day. Cause uh, Bill's mafia is strong, man. It's, it's not only strong, but it's really, it's a really good community. It takes care of one another. Um, and they're known for their philanthropic uh, uh, projects that they do. Um, they really, when they get on something, they'll raise, they'll raise money like nobody's business. And uh, they're just two of the examples. She's just an example of, of how good the, those people are. Yes, sir. She was so easy to work with. Um, she's kept my mom in the loop every step of the process. She sent all the designs over um, and it, really fast. She said it's going to be done by this date. It was done before that date. Um, she sends, you know, personalized note with you to the uh, delivering your mug. And she just, you know, customer service is insane. Um, you know, I'm going to link her down below. Her Twitter's at nautical underscore sky underscore. So um, go follow her, shoot her DM if you want a mug. Like I said, absolutely incredible. And, uh, get and one she'll do her. whatever. Yes, sir. Now, I don't know if she'll do a Pittsburgh Steelers one, but everybody has a price, right? Right. <laughs> but uh, like I said, crazy stuff down, down below, crazy stuff she makes. So check her out down below. And uh, yeah, it's episode nine of In the Film Room. I'm chugging along through this series. I'm so grateful to have you on the show, Jerry O. Um, you know, our friendship goes way, way beyond football. I mean, you're, you're a family friend. Uh, you know, I always hit you up, you know, likewise, see what's going on, make, making sure you guys are all good. And uh, well, let's you know, do it again, man. Let's, let's get through the season. Let's have a great season. Yes, sir. Um, let's, let's, let's have a good season. Once you get through with it, um, maybe let's get reconnected and do another episode and, uh, and uh, you know, see what we can talk about. Yes, sir. I want to stop in Tulsa pretty soon. I've been saying that for years, but I want to stop in well, Tulsa pretty soon on the way back. So maybe, Maybe the uh, first live episode of in the film room. Maybe you never know. Hey, we can but, do it. I d hey, I just up my internet so there will be a blowtorch just for things like this. So yes, we're ready. Like I said, appreciate your time, Jerry. Uh, awesome episode. And uh, like I said, I'm be watching out for Owen, and I'm just excited to excited to see what he does this year. And uh, appreciate you. Appreciate your time. I know you're very busy. Um, I know you. I know you killed it on Monday doing your MC for uh, at the casino. And uh, <laughs> uh, oh, I blew it. I, I I was pretty good. I have to admit, I was pretty no good. Doubt. I trust me. I, you know, I see, uh, see you on all these interviews and uh, podcasts and stuff. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I watch all of them. So like, like I said, appreciate you stopping on this one. Um, big things coming this way for the channel. And, uh, you know, so glad to have you part of it. All right, Dami. Appreciate you, man. Thank all you. Right. See you, Jerry. Peace. Later.